series that we kicked off last week really uh, and the theme that God has given us for this year is go and make disciples and that is uh, what Jesus uh, told us to do just before he went into heaven uh, in Matthew 28 uh, verse 18 20 the key verse for the moment verses for the moment then Jesus came to them and said all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Um, so this, this, is the, this is the series is uh, to look a bit more broadly at this little phrase, go and make disciples. So something caught me... Uh, really spoke to him about the verses just before that. So just before that, if you can get the next slide up, uh, the previous couple of verses says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And then it goes on to the verse I just read before. And what caught my attention is this word, they worshipped. They worshipped him. Now, so what I'm going to preach about is going from a place of worship. Now, I do realise that just by taking that word in that context, I've overstretched that verse to a title, but I will justify what a, my title, going from the heart of worship uh, from the Bible. But I want to say what I mean by worship. I want to define worship as it's defined in the Bible. Because I don't know what they did in that moment when it says they worshipped him whether they got a guitar out and set up the PA and all that. And that is worship, but worship is much bigger than that. So let me explain. Worship basically is a life devoted to God. It's about a life, not about the thing that we do for half an hour before the, the preach. So a few verses that kind of explains a bit what worship is uh, in the Bible. In Luke 4, you've got the story where Jesus was tempted by the devil and the devil says, worship me. And Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Worship is about serving God. It's about, so we sang uh, 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 one of the songs about you only. You and you only. I can't remember the exact words. But worship is about putting God in his right place and serving him first. And in, in that he's quoting the Old Testament. It's about Submitting, following, serving, honouring and obeying God. The first of the Ten Commandments in Exodus says this. You shall have no other gods before me. No other gods before me. So that means about putting God's will before anything else and seeking it. Seeking after God's will, putting him first. Um, in those days they had other gods like Mary took. Uh, shared the story about the god Baal, who doesn't exist. He's a, a, a god, a false god. And we don't ha necessarily have gods that we set up totem poles and that, and worship in that way, but we do have gods. Gods of success and money, things that we can put before seeking God. But God says, no, I am first. It's about prioritizing. No other gods before me. And the other verse that, think, that really helps us understand worship is when when Jesus was asked, asked, which is the most important command, he answered this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. It's in Matthew, he quotes that. And he's quoting the Old Testament. So worship is about submitting, serving, honouring, prioritising, loving God. And it's about friendship. It, love that You can't love the Lord your God that's a relationship word, love. It's about the relationship. A call to follow God and to go with him is a call to an intimate relationship with him. So I want to read from Mark where Jesus called his disciples to follow him and, and to go with him. So in Mark 3 it says this, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted and they came to him. He appointed 12 that, 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. 
This is, just think of this personally. Jesus called those he wanted. Jesus wants you. You're here because Jesus wanted you. We sang about, uh, what was the song, I Desire, what was it? We sang the last song. Uh, was expressing how much we want God. What was the line? Nobody remembers. We're waiting here for you. Waiting for you. God desires us more than we desire him. Jesus wanted these people. He wanted them and they came to him. He pointed 12 that they might be with him. He want, the point is they want, he wanted them to be with him. And to send them out to preach and to have authority to drive demons. But first it was to be with him. Jesus wanted to be with him. In sending us out, he's not sending us away from him. He goes with us. But first he wants to be with him. This is worship. He wants us to live in this life of worship and go in that sense of worship. And he calls, he calls us to be with him and to go out and preach and have authority over demons. But it's important that he wants us to be with him because, uh, uh, because he wants us. He wanted us. When I became a Christian, if, when I heard about what it meant to be a Christian, what I heard was this, that to be a Christian is to commit your life to Christ. And so I understood that it wasn't merely uh, taking on a set of beliefs but making a decision that I would live to serve God. That means that, that God would have the ultimate say in the decisions on my life. And that could be a decision like, should I go into town, like uh, Leslie was sharing about her mum. She submitted that to God. And God answered. And big things like, what job I do, where I live, who I marry. These, God needs to be involved in that because he's Lord. And let me tell you another thing about him. He has the best for us. He has the best plan for us. Absolutely best plan. It's not a scary thing to submit your life to God and decide to commit your life to him. It's not scary because he's good and he loves you. Although I, I have to admit, before I was a Christian, it was. I, I really struggled because I had my plans of what I was going to do. And I didn't really want to submit them to God. But there was a, a moment where I thought, no, I've got to do this. And I prayed a prayer that I read out of a, a little tract. And I asked God into my life to forgive me. And I felt such a relief. But what the surprise was, the next day when I woke up, I can only say that God was in the room. God was present. Nobody had told me that, about the Holy Spirit. I never knew about the presence of God, but God was there. I didn't see him. I didn't feel him. I, it wasn't an emotional thing. I just knew that God was with me. And I, as I was kind of walking around uh, that day and days after, God's with me. This is amazing. I expected that I would serve my life on this earth, doing what he had called me to do, and then I'd die and go to heaven and see him. I didn't know that God would be with me because that's his desire. His heart is to be with me. And I think we need to understand that from himself. He wants us. He wants us more than we want him. And that's important because we need to, as we go to tell the gospel to other people, we need to understand that God wants these people. He wants them. He, he earnestly desires them. He's not dying to, to meet them. He's died to meet them. And he earnestly desires them. He earnestly yearns for them. And so we're going out. When we go, we need to feel that for ourselves and for others. The next verses are important as well. These are the twelve he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. To them he gave the name Barnerges, which, name, which means sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon and Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Why is it important that I read a list of names? 
because they're not just 12. They're individuals with names and characters. Sons of, Sons of Thunder gives an idea of those characters. And they're real. And God calls each of us by name. He's not just looking for a crown. He's, he calls people by name. And so as we go, we need to understand that people out there that we talk to, God calls them by name. So Jesus um, uh, modeled this, uh, this way of, of, of um, going from a place of worship. As he worshipped his father, and I mean by that served, submitted, and had relationship with him, God led him um, in, his, in his mission to go. So he says a couple of things, he said many things, a couple of things he said that uh, uh, show this, this connection with the father. He said in John 12, I did not speak on my own, but the father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and to what to speak. Jesus ministered out of this close relationship with his father, always submitting to what the father led him to do. So Jesus is God. Jesus is the word of God. And yet he submitted to his father as to what to say. He could have, he could have said, well, he's God. He can say anything. It's all powerful. But no, he submitted to his father. And he also said in John 5, Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself, he can only do what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Jesus uh, lived in this relationship of worship and submission to his father and did what the father gave him to do. He spent much time in prayer, seeking God and connecting and hearing from the father. And Jesus' disciples spent time with him learning about him, his authority, his ways, and then he sent them out. Being a Christian is not just being close to God, and it's not just about mission. It's both. We are in this relationship, going together with Jesus. After Jesus went back to heaven, so he physically wasn't present, uh, the disciples continued in a close relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. And we're led by the Holy Spirit in mission. Now I'm going to give you a great example of the Holy Spirit leading a guy called Philip in mission in Acts 8. It says this, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means Queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I? He said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And the story goes on and Philip explains from the Old Testament about Jesus and this, uh, this uh, Ethiopian official receives Christ and gets saved. And on the way, they pass by a pool of water and he gets baptised. And he says he goes on his way rejoicing. This is, this is a very clear example of God speaking it's very clear to somebody and says, go to that chariot speak to that person and guiding them in that way. I want to say, in that God's guiding of us, it's not always that clear. Well, not to me anyway. But just to encourage you, it wasn't always that specific for Philip. A few verses later, it says, Philip, verse 40, Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and travelled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. He wasn't going to specific people that God had told him. He was go just going everywhere preaching the gospel because he was following the mandate that God had give, gives us. But God guides us and he's with us in the going. And it's different. Sometimes it's about obeying the calling. So Philip had a calling to preach the gospel and he obeyed that and preached to everyone. Sometimes 
It's about looking for the open door. Paul writes in Corinthians about he was in Ephesus and he said a door of effective work had opened there. So he stayed there. Jesus told his people, his disciples, when they to go out to um, look for a man of peace. Look for the people who are receptive. And so we don't necessarily need a, need a shouting word from heaven to where to go. Sometimes it's just the door that opens. But we are, it's the, the question is our heart of going where Jesus, being open to go where Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, sends him. Sometimes we are guided by trial and error. Just try and see what works. Uh, in, even Paul, the great apostle, uh, used this. It says in Acts 16, they tried to go into Asia, but they was, the Holy Spirit stopped them. I don't know what that meant, that looked like. The Holy Spirit. Maybe they had their visa rejected or whatever there was a... Who, but he understood it was God guiding. And then they tried in Bithynia, and that didn't work either. The Holy Spirit prevented them. But they were led by the Spirit, by circumstances, to Macedonia. And they understood that was God's guiding. Sometimes we're led by the Spirit in a very clear way, like Philip was. When the Spirit speaks to us, and we say, no, we've got to go to that person. The point is, we walk closely to God. We worship him. We live our lives in an attitude of serving and loving him. And God guides us. And that, so I'm going to uh, ask Leslie to come up. Is it Leslie? and Leslie and Sue. But uh, to see what, how God is guiding her uh, in the go. I know some years ago God led Leslie to reach into Pakistan. You didn't actually go to Pakistan, did you? But God led you to to a charity that works in Pakistan by very clear leading. Uh, but she's going to share what, what God is leading next. I realised the two testimonies last week uh, about going involved a physical, geographical going. Uh, and so I wanted to bring some testimony of what is ne not necessarily geographical. So over to you to share about how God is leading you. Okay. Um, I'll ask Steve to come up as well. Um, because actually... God's doing something different, which is it's really good because um, don't get into an expectation of how you think God's going to work or how God's going to move. Um, what we're going to talk about, where Steve's gone, um, if you take that mic off there and then we, can, we don't have to sort of keep sharing mics. Um, the thing with what God did a few years ago, which was to do with um, raising funds for people in Pakistan, was literally a word in a, in a Bible bookshop. And it's all right, Gareth's going to come and help you out. Um, and I prayed about it. It was totally, as my husband put it, it was total curveball. But God just said, raise funds for children in Pakistan. A um, little while later, listening, I know that's what God wants me to do. And it was an answer to prayer for people that were building schools over in Pakistan. So as you walk with God, you learn to hear him and you have that faith to continue to walk like that. Um, Steve and I are going to share about Revive, actually. It was in the notices that we would be doing this. And this has been a, a really interesting path that God's been taking us on. Back in June, and Tim doesn't know some of this, but I actually found it the other day. And back in June, I often write little notes on my tablet about what God said or what's happening. And um, I retired last year. So I was coming up to the end of, Easter, end of working. And God said, and people were saying, what are you going to do? What are you going to do now? Nothing. God literally said, do nothing. I'm giving you a blank page. And it's like, if anybody knows me, it's like, well, actually, I want, I want to know. God said, do nothing. And then what actually God said, he said, come away. And it's like, oh. Okay, so I actually spent time with God and I, I went through the Gospels and just wrote it all down. And one of the scriptures that God gave me back in June was actually Mark six thirty one to 33. Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. And that's what God gave me. Just rest a while. So I don't do anything else. Lots of people were telling me, oh, you could do this, you could do that. And I said, no, blank page. That's what God said. So following God from the very beginning. And then you were with us. I think I, there was um, 
Lynn did a wonderful job with Revive. And back last summer, she was asking for people to volunteer. And I remember you came up to me, Steve, and you said, oh, how, how, how do I volunteer? I want to volunteer. So I'll pass that over to you. Right, well, am I on? Yes. Good, thanks. Uh, the, whole thing, the whole thing was very interesting for me because all I had is um, Lynn was asking just for these volunteers. And I just said to Jill, my wife, I said, well, I could do a week. Uh, sorry, I could do a day, a week, and just help out there, uh, and we'll see where we'll go from there. Well, I didn't know who Lynn was, hence the reason why I went to Leslie and said, can you put me in touch with this lady? And we did have a chat. I came here one day in the week, and we sat down, and Lynn and I had a chat, uh, and she said to me, would you like to manage it? Well, that was a big jump, <laughs> to be quite honest, from saying I'll give you one week, uh, one day a week uh, uh, to managing it, because I didn't know where all this was going. And, and she explained that, and most of you know some of the reasons for that. Um, well, just to say why I've got, or what my credentials would be for working with Leslie on this, just to start, is that um, I worked for another uh, uh, denomination, and, and it was part of my job to go around the country setting up projects like this and working with local churches. Um, and hence, within uh, the churches that I was uh, in, uh, in Wales, we set up in two churches projects not l totally similar to this, but an outreach to communities. So really, I thought, well, I can, I've got something I can offer. I can give a little bit towards this. Uh, and then she said, you want to manage it? So I went away and I said, God, what, what are you doing here now? Because we'd moved into the area just two years ago or just over. And um, I, I was just wondering what, when we found the church that we were going to worship in, uh, what could I do? How could I, you know, continue my service? In what way would that happen? So I thought this might be one way. And I came up and said, Tim, can I just have a chat with you? And we talked about it. He keeps thinking I went up to him and asked him, you know, uh, is God telling me to do it? I said, yeah, I just need a bit of help, Tim. Because like him, it's not always easy to find what God is saying to you and the direction that he wants you to go. Um, so I was struggling to be quite honest, um, and I, will I, won't I, should I, shouldn't I, take on the sole responsibility of this? Um, well, I never did, and then things changed, and Leslie came on board and was going to lead this project. Now, you could say how jealous I was, but you can say, really, how relieved I was, because God took that out of my hands. Um, but it just seems to be the right kind of partnership um, because the skills. One of the things I was thinking, there's lots of people here uh, in the church who say we had such a great time uh, with the cafe and Revive and so on. And of course, I know nothing about that and how that worked. So mine would have been absolutely from scratch because I would have had to have done it that way. But Leslie has been here a lot longer than me and knows some of those things that went on. And uh, it, it was a, a great thing that I thought, right, we can get a balance. Those things that we need to revive now because of the closure and where we can go with that. And I think some of my uh, input, at least, will be able to take us maybe to uh, the next level or part of the next level. Um, so I'm rather pleased that God said, no, it's not you, Steve, it's going to be Leslie, but you can run along behind and support. And really, that's a great thing. I just want to say this out of humor. When Tim was just telling us about the change in leadership and, uh, and what he's doing and bringing other people on, I thought there's a job there for me. <laughs> I, there is a real job there for me. I could make tea <laughs> and bring biscuits. I could serve that leadership come out and when they finished their important discussions, I can wash the cups up. Now that's service, <laughs> that's, that's service. a servanthood. And that's something mm. that really I want to do within this context, uh, that we can serve this community and really bring something of God Amen. further into people's lives. Amen. Amen.
Woo, woo, woo. So the journey with God and to some extent with each other. So I, throughout the time, was thinking, Lord, put somebody else in. Then I haven't got to think about it. I haven't got to worry about it. It's not, I, I can tick that one off. It's not, Lord, put somebody else in. And there were people interested and then, oh, no, not, no, God's not said. Even um, Steve said, God didn't say yes. And it's like, no. Nope. <laughs> and it's like, oh, okay, God, I get the message. But you know what was really exciting is it's not just me and it's not just Steve. It's a team. And I had a wonderful description of team. Together, we encourage and motivate each other. T-E-A-M. So we are doing this as a team. We have different skill sets, very good skill sets. Um, we have a really good vision. Well, I think it's a really good vision. Um, again, building on what Lynn started, which has done really well. And we have two phases. Phase one is to get the coffee shop up and running. Okay. Um, the idea is we'll start off at least four days a week, 10 till 2, 2.30, but we are happy to expand hours as, re as required, as necessary. However, it does rely on volunteers to some extent because we can't do it all our own. We have, um, I've contacted a really good ethical um, coffee makers over in Gloucester who are Christians themselves. They deal with Christian coffee growers and it's like, wow. God is just putting links into place that I would never have imagined. So even just buying coffee, we are helping communities over in Brazil who are Christians. And there's a little picture of their prayer bench sort of overlooking their coffee fields. And it's just like, wow, God, you were just so much bigger than, than I even imagine or think with the way he puts things into place. Um, children's cafe for mums, grandparents. I've been used to go there myself with, the, with my granddaughters. But the idea is to rebuild community after COVID. I, you know, I don't know whether COVID's ever going to go away. I'm not even getting into that at the moment. But we need to rebuild community. We need to encourage, strengthen, come alongside and give people that sort of sense that they can do it again that they can be safe, that they can be welcomed. I've been looking at sort of different um, strap lines, sort of come in as customers and go out as friends sort of thing. But, you know, it's that sort of, this is a home for you as well. It's not just a cafe. It's more than a cafe. Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah. Um, what, one, of the things, one of the things, Leslie, was this morning, I wasn't quite sure what you were going to ask me to do <laughs> when we got here. So I said, God, you better give me something uh, that, that, that is poignant and important to this. So in, in terms of the spiritual aspect of this as well, I just had this. For those of you who like alliteration, uh, this will be good. Uh, those of you who don't, it won't be. But we'll just see where we go. Uh, okay, I, got, I had this, you know, prayer, process, and purpose. Woo. PPP. I'll have to take my glasses off just to read that. But I want to say this. And I, you know, I, I'm not saying God gave me a vision of this. There's nothing like that at all. But I just felt God sharing with me when I, I, I was thinking about cafe and that it's not just a cafe uh, and so on. Um, without this being prayer, without this being a constant in the life program of the church in this matter, the project has no solid foundation. With that in mind, it is a whole church project. It's a whole Amen. church vision, a God-centered vision, and we can all be working on it. And I find that important, that, you know, if we just set up a cafe uh, and we serve coffee, it doesn't have the same impetus that when the whole church is behind it and get a feel of this is a God thing. And that's what I wanted to be, a God thing. I could tell you stories from around the country. I haven't got time for that, I know. But prayer... That comes revive, you can hear them. <laughs> I'll write them down. Prayer changes things. Now, we Amen. know that. I know that's a cliche, but it's the truth as well. Prayer changes things. And so I think we need, uh, working in this cafe, everybody who really has a feel for evangelism and wants to go and says, my legs won't go, 
you know. My body won't go, but my spirit and my prayer life can go, and we'll be behind you in that. The next thing was the process. The process is seriously important, hence the reason why the two phases uh, and, and so on. Uh, we are not doing it because other places are doing it. That's one thing we've got to be careful of. There are stories around that too. But I want to do it in the way God wants to do it. And sometimes he says we'll develop from the floor up and we'll move forward in that way. Why? Because his plan needs to be the process. Amen. His plan needs to be the process. People will come with all sorts of needs. The least might be coffee. That's the thing. And probably well. The least might be coffee, and we are there as the body of Christ. The last little thing, purpose. Everything that we do, or at least I feel, needs to have purpose. It needs to be more than a cafe. Yep. That's what we feel anyway. We want uh, to regain what we had before and more, before the yep. closure and more, and we'll see God develop that. A whole church involvement with prayer will help bring about the more. And I had just uh, my silliness, an adaptation of C.T. Studd's quote from last week. Some want to live within the sound of church and chapel bell. Tim wants to run a coffee shop within a yard of hell. <laughs> now, I can't help my silliness. It's true. That's part of his vision. It needs to be the vision of the church. And it becomes a coffee shop and a rescue shop together. Amen. Let's God do that. Really well put. Coffee shop and rescue shop. Amen. So God is putting together a team. It's not just one person. I don't think any one person can replace Lynn, who did a, such a really good job. But he's now putting together a team. We've had um, chats with somebody this week who's um, wanting to look at the craft side of things to help with well-being. And it's just so amazing. I had a conversation um, last week with, um, with my nurse, just chatting to her. I've retired now, but I'm sort of going to be sort of helping with a coffee or what you, uh, with a cafe, what you're going to do. Oh, it's this, and we're sort of looking at doing that. Oh, she said, my interest is people that, um, and I keep forgetting what it is, and that's not far part of, um, I have to think about, with dementia. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll be the first one helped. <laughs> and, that's, and I keep forgetting it. It's just so funny, and it's like, yeah, maybe I'll be the first one that's helped. So, and that was certainly sort of on your heart. Yes. I've got that this is maybe part of the reason I need to be doing this to keep, keep my brain going. But it's just finding those activities to help people. And she said, oh, that's really on my heart. And when are you opening? And, you know, can I send people? Can I, can I sort of advertise that, that you're doing that? And it's like, yeah, of course you can. So I'll get back to her. We are looking at opening sort of partly depends on how the building's going, sort of end of February, March, how COVID is going. But basically, watch this space. It is just amazing. It's like, wow, hardly done a thing. And God just puts people in our way. And it's just like, wow, I probably would never have thought of a team. But do you know what? God had it in mind from the beginning. And it's like, oh, just amazing. Together, that's all of us are part of the team. We encourage and motivate each other as a team. So if you are wondering, after all that with prayer, process, and purpose. Um, if you have been really, really excited today, hopefully, and you're thinking, what can I do? We have volunteer packs. Um, it's a little bit different rather than just coming and telling us. We want to do the process properly. So there are volunteer forms just as to why do you want to be involved? What section do you want to be involved? It might just be that cooking's you know, what you want. It might be that you want to lead a craft or you want to just come and sort of sit and talk with people or can I help on the sort of be at the reception side or clearing tables. There's so many different openings. Um, but we need you to be part of the team. Thinking of that sort of um, poster from the World Ward, your church needs you. Actually, God needs you. And we most certainly yeah. need yeah. God. 
So thank you for that. That's our story so far on Revive. We are a great team. It is just, just amazing. And actually, our hearts are just so attuned with, with what I believe God wants to do. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So I'm going to pass back to Tim. Have we done what we should have done? Probably that and more. Woo, woo, woo. It's going to be a great double act, isn't it? <laughs> Morecambe and Wise. It's kind of that's no comment uh, yeah so I wanted to them to share that because it's happening now but also uh, very different from last week uh, just to show that we can go where we are it's not it's a heart attitude of being ready and have a heart for people so you can go right here in this building by uh, volunteering with revive Do you know, uh, one thing that just struck me some people have gone by planting the church in Ross and some have gone planting the church in Lemster. Uh, wasn't it great last week to have us all together? It was so good to be all together. It's so good to have the big band, full band, and uh, a, a couple of thoughts, you know, full. And a couple of thoughts struck me is um, CLC is a bigger church than we thought. Uh, and it was good to see people that we never knew because they've joined in Ross and joined from Lemston. They've never been here. And it was good to see people that went out and planted. Um, but what also struck me was uh, that we've paid a price here in Hereford to send people. And I just want to say thank you for paying that price, you guys here in Hereford. Not that we gave you the option, but thank you. And it means that people have had to double up. Uh, we means that today, because Tim, who was going to be playing guitar and leading, ha has tested positive, that we had to call on Tony, who doesn't usually play. So we've all paid a price. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Tim. Whereas before we had more guitar, no. And it's, it's, actually, it's great that Tony's leading again. I, and I know Tony's enjoyed it. It's been great. But we haven't the resources. But thank you for stepping up and into uh, the, the space that was created. And thank you for the pain, the price. But I want to say, I think it's worth it. I think it's been great to have planted and to see uh, a church growing in Lemston, a church growing in Ross, adding people. Uh, but there is a price to, to go. Um, but I also remember the verse, you know, we, we want to have great lives, don't we? Um, we want to have full lives. And Jesus um, promised abundant life. I've come to give you life. But he said, if you seek your own life, you lose it. But if you lose your life, for his sake, you'll find it. We, it is costly to follow uh, where God goes, uh, sends you sometimes, because it's not your idea and it's not your plan. It's not what you want. But there's life there, and it's the best thing. Uh, it, it came to the verse in Psalms. It says, blessed are those who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. We're on a journey of knowing God. Let's set our hearts on this journey of worshipping God and knowing God more. It's a journey. It's not about being arrived and all there. But it goes on to say, as they pass through the valley of weeping, they make it a spring. Those of us are seeking God, as we walk through life, we will cause a valley of weeping to become a, a valley of life. Um, and just a couple of things that I felt God uh, speak to me specifically. I feel there's someone here that you... I, I, I think I don't know you, but you feel you've always felt misunderstood. And that's been a real burden to you. And sometimes you feel like your head is, is bowed down by this weight of not, of not being understood. But I want to say God understands you. God creates, created you, and you don't need to conform to the way everybody thinks you should be because God understands you made the way you are and God wants to bring people to you that get you uh, sometimes you, you, you you're a deep thinker and you, you think he goes very deep and uh, sometimes that troubles you but God wants to also lift you up and, 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 and to, you to find people that say yeah, I get you I'm like that but what God wants to say he he understands you and you, you're, you're not 
you're not odd. You just haven't found the people that are like you yet. And uh, I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to uh, chat with you if that's you. And I also uh, felt God say, for some people, you, one person here, I believe, particularly, you come with think, just thinking this. There was stuff I used to do. I used to serve in ministry. And that's gone. And God wants to restore that to you. Um, and I'd love to pray for you as well. But to all of us, I'd like to say, just remind us that God calls, Jesus calls us to himself first. He wants you. And if you've never taken a step to follow him, I want to say Jesus wants you. He desires you. He, he wants you more than what you do for him. He wants to spend time with you. And if you just respond to that, if you've never done it, say, Jesus, I want to follow you, be in my life, then he will hear you. And I'd love to pray for you as well. But I'm going to pray for us all and then uh, close the meeting and I'll hand back to Leslie. Father, I thank you that you send us out on a mission, but you've already been there uh, and you've, you go with us. I thank you that you've gone ahead of Leslie and Steve in what you've called them to do. You will put it all together beforehand. That's the same for all of us. But I thank you that you want us to be with you and you desire us more than we desire you. I pray that we would increasingly in our lives uh, burn to be in your presence, to serve you, to find life that is truly life, that is not about what we can achieve, fame and fortune or whatever. It's about knowing you more and more. Help us to put that in first place and trust you for uh, what we need and let the things that tempt us uh, diminish in their attractiveness because we are uh, in love with you more and more. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.